Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick for Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about crashes. This is the PowerPoint presentation that was supposed to go with Sunday's live feed, uh, Smart Sunday number 28. So we're going to do the PowerPoint presentation. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about crashes, the reasons for crashes, the historical evolution of car crashes over the 20th century and into the 21st century, talking about that, giving you the top reasons why we have traffic crashes, how they have moved into the second spot of reasons why people die in our sort of first world countries, I use that term loosely, and then some of the advances, the technological and medical science advancements that have been made that have reduced the number of traffic fatalities. And we'll talk about why maybe that isn't such a good thing. Now, just before we get started here, if you're new to Smart Drive Test, Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license regardless of class, veteran drivers to remain crash free, and CDL drivers to start a career as a truck or bus driver. So if you're new here, hit that subscribe button as well. Hit that bell, that way you'll get instant notification when I get the videos up for you. So without further ado, let's head over to the PowerPoint presentation. Car crashes. So one of the things that we're all familiar with is crash test dummies. There's even a band named the crash test dummies and they have given safety ratings to new vehicles and tell consumers which vehicles are safer than other vehicles. And this has really driven the sale of vehicles because it's at the foremost of consumers' minds in terms of what vehicles they buy, whether they're safe or not, especially for those that have families. They're looking for vehicles that are safe and get high crash ratings. One of the other things that's driven sales of SUVs, particularly uh, kind of a historical overview of cars and in the OPEC oil crisis in the early 1970s, for a decade and a half that changed the, how big cars were, they became much smaller. And then into the 1990s when all of that began to recover and fuel wasn't a concern anymore, it, the SUVs became a big sale in terms of the types of vehicles that we purchased because they were bigger vehicles and the auto manufacturers marketed them as a way that you were going to survive a, a traffic crash. So this is why we have a lot of SUVs and those types of things. And interestingly enough, in the 1960s, safety ratings were not something that auto manufacturers thought they could sell. And now we look 50, 60 years later down the road and safety features are very much at the forefront of what drives consumers to purchase vehicles is that they have to be safe. So for those of you who are new to Smart Drive Test and don't know me, my name is Rick August. Uh, I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s. I became a driving instructor, a commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, my expertise is air brakes and truck driving mostly. I did drive bus in Australia when I was there for a year for Greyhound. And as well, I drove for the regional V-Line uh, bus company as well, which is just hooks up the local train where it has gaps and uh, they transport passengers, obviously, between the different train stations. Uh, I did earn a doctorate from the University of Melbourne in legal history. Legal history, for those of you who don't know, is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing, specifically as it relates to traffic. So that's my background, and I've been a licensed driving instructor here in British Columbia since 2008. And I still am, and I do have a, a driving school here in the province as well but I don't really teach people in vehicle. Most of my stuff is all done online. Uh, this week's vehicle was how to do a U-turn. I got that video up and for licensed uh, drivers, passenger vehicle drivers who are going for a road test, uh, how to do a U-turn is step-by-step -step instructions about how to do a U-turn at conventional intersections, T intersections on busy roadways and on highways. It shows you how to do all of that and gives you reasons why. U-turns are not part of the driving culture here in British Columbia because there are a lot of prohibitions against U-turns. So uh, just leave me a comment down in the comment sec section there for those of you and tell me whether U-turns are part of your driving culture. So traffic crash deaths, interesting enough, in the 20th century, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, at the end of the 1900s, war, famine, and disease were the number one killers of people in the world. By the beginning, in, in 100 years later, at the beginning of the 2000s, Suicide, traffic crashes, and terminal illness are now the number one killers of people in, as I said, first world countries, and I use that term loosely. 
And in most countries in the world, the United States and Canada and Australia and Britain, Europe, other places in the world, if you took all of the traffic crashes and put all of the traffic crashes in one place at one time, it would be declared a national emergency. That's how many people are killed, injured, and maimed in traffic crashes every year. And you can see that it came to public attention as early as 1924. I found this uh, drawing in the London Free Press when I was doing work on history there uh, in the early 2000s at the University of Western Ontario. And you can see the um, figure of war handing the trophy to the automobile driver who's caricaturized as Japanese, oddly enough, which is even funnier by the fact that in the 1980s and 1990s, Japan went on to become <laughs> very much the auto manufacturers to beat and still are in this day and age producing quality vehicles. But the other thing that this epitomizes is just a quick history lesson here was the fear that white people had of the Japanese because the Japanese had defeated the Russians in the 1904 Japanese Russo War, which is the first war that Asians defeated a white nation, which really sort of, you know, spurred xenophobia in the world. And then, of course, this would go on and we'd have the awful event of the Holocaust in during the Second World War. So there's a lot going on in this image here, but essentially what it needs to show is, is that the automobile killed, injured, and made more people than soldiers sent to war. And we're talking about World War I, World War II, uh, Korean, the Vietnam War, and all the other wars in the world. So the number of deaths attributed to traffic crashes are a lot. All of us know somebody, unfortunately, who has been involved or killed in a car crash. Uh, my niece in, 20, in 2006 was killed in a car crash, and it, it was very devastating to the whole family. Uh, Princess Diana is probably one of the most famous deaths of somebody killed in a car crash. James Dean was killed in a car crash, and this is a picture of his speeding ticket that he received only hours before he was killed in a in a traffic crash. For those of us here in Canada that know about uh, Tim Hortons, the donut shop, the very famous donut shop, some of us uh, <laughs> jokingly say that uh, Tim Hortons is next to patriotism here in Canada. And then, of course, in a very ironic traffic crash death, Paul Walker, the one of the stars of the Fast and the Furious uh, movie franchise, uh, which was all about cars, fast cars, and souped up cars racing in the quarter mile and street racing, he was riding in a car as a passenger with his uh, financial advisor and was killed in, killed in a car crash. No one is immune to traffic crashes, and this is the point that I want to make, is, is that we all ride in cars and we're all susceptible to being injured, maimed, or killed in a car crash. And interestingly enough, if we were hurt or injured on a horse, or we were injured on a bicycle, or we were injured or killed on, or not killed obviously, but injured on a motorcycle, none of us would get back on one of those things. However, if we're injured in a car crash and we go to the hospital and we have some time to convalesce and then we get out of the hospital, first thing we do is we get back in a car. It's, it's very strange in the way that that happens in our world. You know, interestingly enough, different studies around the world in terms of car crashes have determined that most car crashes, the highest number of car crashes, do not happen in the winter time. They do not happen in bad driving conditions. Most of them happen in clear weather on dry roads, and the driver is sober and the vehicle is mechanically fit. And most of the car crashes, believe it or not, happen in the summertime. Most of us uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, they happen in July, June, July, and August. And those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, they happen in late December, January, February, and early March is when the most number of car crashes are, which is counterintuitive to what most people think. And the first time I was asked that question, I went, well, it's got to be in the winter, and it, it, but it's not true. It's, it's in the summer. So that's when most crashes happen. There are twice the number of traffic crashes in city areas, in, in urban areas, but there are twice the number of fatalities in rural areas, even though there are less crashes. And there's a number of reasons attributed to the fact that there are more fatalities in uh, rural areas than there are in urban areas. First of all, somebody has to find you. If one of you isn't conscious in the vehicle, if one of the occupants isn't conscious in the vehicle, you have to be awake to be able to call emergency services. Second of all, emergency services have to respond to you and you're often a long way from emergency services. And up until the advent of GPS and, and tracking devices and whatnot, 
uh, it was difficult to find the specific location of car crashes. I mean, that's getting a little better with GPS and other technology and those types of things. And it is easier to transport you to hospitals and whatnot in terms of uh, helicopters and whatnot. The other interesting thing about most crashes that occur in rural areas is that these are single vehicle crashes. And there are a number of reasons why we have single vehicle crashes. And I'll talk a little further about that, a little more about that in another slide here. Uh, actually, no, that was right on single vehicle crashes. The number one reason for a lot of the single vehicle crashes is people are intoxicated. They're either drunk or they've been taking illegal substances or drugs or prescription medication and those types of things. And again, I come back to that point of uh, intoxication. Most intoxication happens because of prescribed medication and over-the-counter medication, not because of illegal, illegal drugs. Uh, other people single vehicle crashes people fall asleep they're driving too fast on country roads and those types of things and they strike a fixed object or go into the ditch or hit a tree or those types of things so they're the, most of the reasons cannot be figured out why the crash happened we have a general overview of why these crashes happen but most of these single vehicle crashes the reasons are not attributable to why the, it, it happened but most of the time it's intoxication or fatigue or the person fell asleep at the wheel which is obviously fatigue and or the person was speeding so those are the top reasons for crashes and single vehicle crashes and crashes in the country and whatnot uh, top three reasons for crashes speeding failing to yield and following too close these are the three reasons people are going too fast they're failing to give the right of way to other road users or they're following too close as you can see these two cars in the center lane here they're simply following too close there's no reason for that black car to be that close to those other two vehicles so if you manage the space around your vehicle and you drive in the spaces between the vehicles you're going to reduce the chances of you being involved in a traffic crash. So that's one of the things you can do is manage the space around your vehicle. Now I did touch a little bit on intoxication when uh, single vehicle crashes in the late 1960s, drinking and driving, I mean, those were very much part and parcel of our culture. Uh, the police implemented anti-drink driving laws in the late in the early 1970s, implemented uh, that we had to wear seat belts. And a generation later, most of us are wearing seatbelts. Seatbelt use is about 96% now, and, and you know, as we're leading up to 2020 here. Uh, young people drinking, driving, dating, and distracted driving. And I mean, distracted driving is huge now with cell phones and those types of things. And I certainly see that it wasn't something that came down the pike. Uh, drink driving laws are changing as well to try and combat that problem, but I don't think that we're combating that problem. I mean, here in British Columbia, the snow is beginning to melt, and if you go down, and drive along the highways when the snow, the snow melts here in another week or two out of the ditches, you'll see the number of beer cans and liquor bottles and those types of things in. So I don't think that the campaign against drink driving is, is winning in any sense of the imagination. Now, one of the things that Australia does well that we in North America do not do well is their campaigns against fatigue and driving tired. And they have huge campaigns against driving tired and there are a lot more rest areas in Australia on roads and those types of things. And I mean, maybe in the country where you live, because obviously uh, some of the countries I haven't been to, but do they have an awareness about driving tired? Leave a comment down in the comment section there and just let me know if uh, there's an awareness about driving tired because uh, there have been studies done about that. There, you know, the, the research that's beginning to come out about how dangerous it is to drive tired uh, is beginning to give us some idea of that. But you need to be aware in terms of driving tired that there's two times of the day that you're going to be tired, sort of one to five in the afternoon and one to five in the early morning. Those are the two sort of dangerous times. Because we all have a, a, biological, clock, a biological clock, we all have circadian rhythms, and those are the times that we get tired. And if you're driving during those times of the day, try not to eat a big meal because that'll, again, make you more tired. And some of the ways that you can combat fatigue, if you do absolutely have to, of course, the number one reason is to pull over and get a bit of sleep. But if you're eating or talking to somebody else, that'll help to combat some of the fatigue. Vehicle safety features, this is one of the other thing that has reduced the number of fatalities in terms of car crashes, uh, crumple zones. Most of the cars now, when, when they've been in a crash, they look like they're completely destroyed. They're designed to do that, and it absorbs the energy of the crash to protect the occupants in the vehicle. Safety glass in the windshield, breakaway steering columns. Uh, breakaway steering columns came from the study by uh, Ralph Nader, who is a former uh, U.S. presidential candidate. He also wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, which is in the early 1960s, and he specifically took aim at the Chevrolet Corvair. And one of the problems with the Chevrolet Corvair was it did not have a breakaway steering column, and even in minor crashes, 
on a front impact, the steering column would come into the occupant, uh, the passenger compartment, push up underneath the driver's neck and snap their neck and kill them in a, in a minor car crash. So that was one of the uh, takeaways of that study was is that we have breakaway steering columns in vehicles. We also implemented mandatory seatbelt use and airbags. And one of the other things in this picture is side impact bars, but I can tell you that side impact bars do not work. There's just not enough strength in those bars to be able to cope with the sheer forces in a, in a T-bone crash. And again, I'll put a card up in the corner for you here on the video on T-bone crashes and why T-bone crashes are so dangerous. So have a look at that as well. Finally, the last thing that has reduce the number of traffic fatalities is advances in medical science. And most of these advances in medical science came out of the Vietnam War, especially as it relates to trauma. And emergency crews know that if they have a serious injury of a person in a car crash or some other accident, that the first hour is absolutely crucial to getting that person to medical services and getting them into surgery. If they can get that person to a hospital and into emergency services within the first hour, there is a high chance of that person being able to recover from that kind of accident. And it's called the golden hour. And it, it's the 60 minutes that they have to get the person into surgery and have to get that person uh, surgery and that way that person will survive. Now one of the other things is that came out of this and I wrote an article about this and, and said that yes there are less traffic deaths and more people are surviving traffic crashes but the problem is is the quality of life what is the quality of life these people have after the traffic crash are they injured do they have some sort of debilitating injury that's going to cause them to have a reduced quality of life for the rest of, for the for the remainder of their natural life so Maybe this is a good thing, maybe it's not a good thing because some people are you know, living with injuries from a car crash for the rest of their life, whereas prior they would have just died. And I know that's a pretty callous thing to say, but I mean, leave your thoughts down in the comment section there. We can have a discussion about it to know whether, you know, that, you know, is it better? It is definitely better because we are definitely, a lot of people are surviving car crashes that at one time they wouldn't have survived. So those are some of the reasons for car crashes and some of the awareness around car crashes and sort of a historical overview of car crashes. So quick review of car crashes. Over the 20th century, car crashes killed, injured, and made more people than soldiers sent to war. So they have been devastating. They still are devastating. We're still having the same number of crashes today and same number of injuries resulting from car crashes as we did 50 or 60 years ago. Unfortunately, people are still driving intoxicated, they're driving drunk, and now we have distracted driving, which is adding to the complexity of driving. Yes, we have more safety features and road engineering features that are actually saving people and, and advances in medical science and all of those th types of things are reducing the number of fatalities, but we're still having the same number of injuries. Unfortunately, we all know somebody who's been involved in a car crash and is, is living with injury due to a car crash. So know that car crashes are dangerous. Unfortunately, we get lulled into a false sense of safety in our vehicles because our vehicles are a very personal space and they have lots of safety features on them that do protect us, but we're still susceptible to car crashes. And know that most car crashes are not going to happen in inclement weather. Most car crashes are going to happen on dry roads on clear days and most often very close to home. So know that. As well, know the fact that although there are twice the number of car crashes in urban areas, there are twice the number of fatal car crashes in rural areas. And most of the reasons for these car crashes being fatal in rural areas is because your distance to emergency um, services, getting to hospitals, the emergency crews finding you. Yes, we have GPS and those types of things that help out and whatnot. And I mean, if you have a single vehicle crash in a rural area, you may be unconscious and not be able to contact emergency services and whatnot. So that's the other issue is somebody getting in contact or somebody actually finding you and whatnot. So. That's kind of an overview of, of traffic crashes and some of the things you could keep in mind when you're driving that might help you to reduce the risk of being involved in a traffic crash. Question for my smart drivers. Do you know somebody who's been involved in a traffic crash? Leave a comment down in the comment section there. All of that helps the new drivers and the veteran drivers working to be crash free. If you like what you see here, share, subscribe, leave a comment down in the comment section. As well, hit that thumbs up button. Head over to the Smart Drive Test website, sign up for Pass Your Road Test First Time. It's a course for new drivers. 
and it'll help you pass your road test first time guaranteed 60 day money back guarantee if you take the whole course and you don't pass your road test first time i'll give you your money back as well failing a road test is a real drag you don't want to have to go to school the next day and tell your friends you weren't successful on your road test so head over there pick up that course look down in the, in the description there and get your coupon for 30 percent off the course pick that up over at the smart drive test website i'm rick with smart drive test thanks very much for watching good luck on your road test and remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. A man on his way home from work learned from the radio that uh, most traffic crashes occur within 20 minutes of home. Went straight home and told his wife that they were moving because they were at risk of being involved in a traffic crash.